So, in the previous lecture, we discussed um, some um, examples of active absorbing phase transitions, where you have many um, absorbing states. And uh, so, we discussed this conserved lattice gas model and we discussed another model, this uh, pair contact process. Okay. So, one can of course, define many more such models and that was not the aim, but just to get a feel of what kinds of possible systems one can have. Okay, so, now, uh, what I want to do today is to actually connect the, uh, ab this active absorbing transitions with many absorbing states with sand piles and give some examples of um, simple models of sand piles, where you can solve the problem exactly. Okay. Uh, but before I do that, um, any questions about the previous lecture? Everything was very clear. Okay. So, so, let us take something like this pair contact process. So, just to remind, we discussed the case where uh, A A can go to A A A with rate lambda and A A can go to A with rate 1 and then we said that there can be a state uh, with uh, depending on the value of lambda, if it is high you can be in an active state, if it is low you can be in an absorbing state. Okay, so, suppose I am in an absorbing state, what can I say? So, one of the kinds of questions we can study is that, okay, suppose you start with an absorbing state and I create by hand a local activity. So, what happens to it? So, I can imagine the case where the activity will initially um, spread for a while and then eventually die, because this is the you know it is absorbing state, if the lambda is too low. Okay. So, that is my typical scenario, I will of course, sometimes the infection will die immediately, but it can survive for a while and then die. So, I can ask what is the uh, typical size of the um, infection episode. So, you know, now I will draw a space time picture, and this is time and this is sort of some infection occurs here and this is um, dead outside. Okay. So, I can say number of infections, uh, size of infected region, or duration of infection. Okay. So, duration of infection will be something like this, size will be something like this, uh, size of infected region is like that and number of infections is like the volume of this region. Okay. And of course, all of these are stochastic variables, uh, but then I can look at the expectation value of these things. and see how they change. Okay. <clears throat> so, if you are um, at very low lambda, then of course, all these will be small and if you increase lambda, they will increase and I suppose, if by mistake I went beyond the critical threshold, then they will become infinite, because the infection will keep growing, these sizes will become infinite. Okay. So, all of these variables roughly speaking as a function of lambda will grow like that. 
uh, what any of these three. And so, I can ask how do they grow and uh, so, I can define power for these things. This will grow like power A, this will grow like inverse power lambda c minus lambda to the power a. This will grow with some other power and so then that will grow with some other power and I can look at these powers or I can try to predict them from theory. So, the interesting question which came up was that how does this answer these exponents a, b, c depend on the background on which you started. In principle, for any particular fixed background, you can determine these numbers a, b, c, because there is still a stochastic evolution, which will not have fixed values. So, they will evolve. The fact that they will become infinite when lambda crosses some threshold is also clear. And so, may, so how do, do these exponents depend on the background you start with? For example, I may start with everything empty or I may start with background with things with density rho and these kinds of stuff. These questions are rather difficult, but when people try to study them numerically, actually maybe one should uh, yeah, when people try to study them numerically they found answers which seem to depend on the background. Okay. So, of course, the number of possible backgrounds is infinite. So, you know I am not able to study all those infinity of backgrounds in any great detail. So, what one does is to put backgrounds in classes and then draw a typical ensemble of a class and then um, determine the exponents for that one. For example, I might say that let me consider the background which is the periodic structure 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, 0 like that and then I study perturbation on this and determine a, b, c for this background. Then I can take a random background with a density rho and make 1000 realizations and just see what you get for this by averaging then involves averaging over histories as well as of the initial background. Okay. Um, so, this answer turns out to be rather complicated and uh, so people found that you can define two kinds of, okay, so anyway you can study this uh, stuff, but then you can also go to the active region. So, active region, uh, this is for lambda less than lambda c. So, you can get lambda greater than lambda c, then I just uh, start with some background and see what happens is the system goes into some active state. In the active state, I can determine various quantities like the um, inactive phase, you can determine mean activity per site. Or you can determine activity activity correlations. or I can do something like I have some mean activity, then I create a local disturbance and see how long does the system take to recover from this local perturbation. Okay. So, you can define relaxation time, which is the relaxation in the equilibrium in the steady state, in the active steady state and you can also define some time like time of you start with some initial state and time required to get into the steady state and whether uh, these two times are equal clearly not they do not have to be equal you know because the time to get into equilibrium depends on how you started with. 
but then I can ask oh well the precise time is different, but when I look at the way the time increases when I increase lambda like this power, the power may still be robust even though actual times are not robust right. So, that is a slightly more subtle question, but uh, so we will only remember this much that you can define quantities in equilibrium in the state sorry not I should not say equilibrium in the steady state and quantities in the absorbing state so which are transient um, activity in the absorbing state and, um, and the various correlation functions in the active steady state and uh, look at these exponents and see if there is any meaning to be attached to something here versus something there no so let me be more precise so this is um, called the c perpendicular typical size of infected region will be the transfer size and duration will be called c parallel it is the uh, duration is sort of the size of this cluster in this time direction and then uh, you know these things go like 1 upon lambda minus lambda c to the power nu parallel and this goes like lambda c minus lambda to the power nu perpendicular. So, there are some values of these numbers in equilibrium I can define this function this function at let us say fixed time t equal to t prime will go like exponential minus r over c parallel and suppose you look at the same kind of stuff, but at same place, but at different times this will go like exponential minus delta t divided by c sorry parallel. This is the time um, correlation length or correlation time and this is the spatial co correlation length you know and so these are functions of distance from critical point and this is the correlation length in the active phase and this is the correlation length in the inactive phase and so they whether there is any connection between them. Okay. So, so what was found which is actually very nice and simplifying is that the quite often the active phase is unique. So, if you have you start with any initial condition you get into the same active state. So, these exponents are very well defined and you can try to understand them. These ones which are called spreading exponents they are dependent on the initial background necessarily and they do not have to be universal. So, you can have system in which these exponents defined here depend on the background density or some such thing continuously, but these are very well defined and they do not depend on the background density by definition. There is no background density is the active steady state which has a unique density. Okay. Very good. So, now what I want to do is I want to take another model which is in the class of these assisted hopping models. Okay, so, this is sand piles is a 
Okay. So, I will define the problem as follows. You take a two dimensional lattice. Uh, you have particles, maybe you can have more than one particle at a site and these particles hop around. Okay. So, each particle hops um, with a rate um, gamma 1 to a nearest neighbor site. Okay. So, then you can start with some density of particles, right now they are independent of each other, they keep on hopping around and you can look at the steady state of this system. Okay. That is a trivial non interacting random walkers model. Now, we can add a little bit of interaction and the interaction I want to add is the following that if more than three particles at a site, the topple at rate gamma 4. So, we say that you know 4 is too much this is I am trying to remember the BTW sand pile model which we defined in the first lecture. So, there 1, 2, 3 were stable, but 4 was unstable and you know there was a toppling and 4 particles were sent to 4 neighbors. So, I am trying to do the same thing, I am saying 4 is not very good, these people do not like to have 4 at one place. So, if there are more than 4 by accident, then 4 people live together in 4 different directions and this occurs at rate gamma 4. Okay. If I put gamma 4 equal to 0, then of course, this problem becomes the old problem, but I can also imagine a case where gamma 4 is much bigger than gamma 1. Then the individual particles are not hopping, so 0, 1, 2, 3 will be all stable, but if you have 4 particles, they will topple at, at after a little bit of time there is some waiting time because this is in continuous time the process occurs with the rate, but they will eventually topple and once they topple they may send a particle there and that one will topple and so on and so forth. So, the dynamics of this system is the same as the dynamics of the BTW sand pile. If I start with a stable configuration, uh, so uh, all heights are 0 to 3. Then by hand I move one of the particles from one place to another that is under the process gamma 1 which is very very slow. Then I may cause a sequence of topplings which will be like the B, um, topplings in the BTW model, but eventually the system will come to rest again there will be everything will be height up to 3 and it stays there. until you know this very slow process of gamma 1 happens and some other particle jumps all of a sudden and that may initiate a second avalanche. Okay. So, how does this model differ from the BTW model? This model differs from the BTW model in the fact that I can actually put this thing on a periodic boundary condition then the total number of particles will be conserved. Okay. So, in the BTW model once the system reaches a stable configuration it will just stay there that is an absorbing state. I have to push it away from this absorbing state by some external perturbation which there was adding some grain from outside. Here I am not going to add a grain from outside I am just going to move a grain from one place to the next place neighbor and that will also initiate an avalanche of some sort. Right. So, um, the, um, so, this system will go from one absorbing state to a different absorbing state to a different absorbing state under this very slow process gamma 1 and I can still ask the same kinds of questions what is the typical uh, duration of an avalanche, what is the typical size 
um, horizontal um, the trans the spatial size of an avalanche region and so on and so forth okay uh, now yes, yes. No, under gamma 1 it can jump, because there may be a state like this, 3 particles here, 1 particle here which is stable, but this 1 particle may jump here, which will make it unstable and then it will cause, an, because you know then these 4, this will make some particle go here which may cause further toppling. So, a stable configuration on um, shifting a particle may become unstable. Okay. So, the interesting question now would be that okay, so you can do this, this st stuff has a, if I plot activity in this system as a function of time, activity is the number of sites which are able to topple. I will find something like this and then for a long time nothing happens and then something and then like that. So, this is something was initiated, then there was an avalanche and it stopped and for a long while it stopped and then there is a second process and then third and so on, right. It is very similar to the original model, except that there is no particles lost and there is no particles added. So, this model um, is called fixed energy centpiles. Unfortunate nomenclature, but anyway, I cannot change it because if it was fixed and fixed particle number sent piles is a much more reasonable name. But one is kind of mixing up metaphors by calling it fixed energy because you know what is called energy in some other picture is actually called particle number in sent piles. So one shouldn't. Uh, use this um, unfortunate terminology, but you know uh, what is in a name. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. So, so uh, this is a connection of sorts. Uh, however, in this case, you can have a steady state of the system for arbitrary density. You can start with any density initially and the density will be conserved in time and of course, under evolution there will be a steady state. Okay. So, what in the other sand pile model there was a unique steady state. Now, you have a whole family of steady states de determined by a parameter which is the density of the sand. So, what is the um, yes. Yeah. Sorry. It's not no, but there is no dissipation here. As I said, this is a periodic system, and particles can don't get lost. So suppose there is only one particle. What happens? It sits here. Then under gamma one, sometimes it comes here, sits here, then moves there. Okay, there is a long time steady state in which all sites are equally visited. Yeah. Okay. So, it was immediately realized of course, that in this system there is a full class of steady states, but then suppose you change the density. Then what happens is that the mean size of activity between two such different events increases. So, now first I consider the case where both gamma 1 and gamma 4 are finite but then I take the limit gamma 1 goes to 0 or let us consider the case gamma 1 is 0. Then sometimes you will not get into a steady state, you will just get into an absorbing state and the system will get stuck there. However, if the density is big enough, then uh, um, gamma 1 is 0, but the activity can keep on going forever. Okay. So, at least in the active phase, the limit gamma 1 goes to 0 is well defined and the, you, there is an active state. right? So, then I can look at the uh, uh, correlation lengths as defined before, no, in, in, the, in the active phase 
and ask how does the um, exponents in the active phase behave in this model and are they the same as in the corresponding um, corresponding there is no BTW model in the active phase. The BTW model is constructed to be only at the critical point, but in this model you can access the absorbing state as well as the active phase and is there a connection between the kinds of exponents you can study here in this model and the kinds of exponents people define in the sand part. Yes. Uh, no, for for one fixed number, let us say there is the, the, yes, it is possible to have many steady states for a fixed number. That's an additional complication, but uh, I will answer that question privately later. Let me not get sidetracked here. Okay, it's a it's, um, if you have stochastic evolution, then you don't get many steady states. But if you have deterministic toppling rules, then it turns out there are additional toppling invariants which say that if you have this value of toppling invariant, it cannot change. And so then you have different steady states corresponding to different toppling invariants. Okay. So it is possible to have it, but certainly you can study models where that does not happen. But if the number is not fixed, then you just want unique steady state. If the number is not fixed, uh, for in like in the BTW model, yes, there is a st unique steady state. Okay. Okay. So, well, so I guess if I go um, sort of naively and go into the analogy with critical phenomena I studied before. So, what I should do is I should study something like the exponents at the critical point, because that is what the BTW model gives me. So, what will I do here? So, we defined in the active phase is some correlation function of delta x delta t and depending on you know it is uh, how it decays in space or time I define correlation lengths in space and time. These were uh, varying with the concentration p and then I let p get closer and closer to the critical point and see what happens to this function. So, this g of r t change of notation goes like 1 upon r to the power a prime some power right. This power is of course, related to the power in the active phase. So, if I look at the active phase I can still determine a prime by taking the limit of activity going to 0. If I am in the inactive phase I can define some sense function in the steady state still and then take the limit of um, density going to the critical density and define the same limit and hope that these two are equal. E yes. Yeah. Ah, very good. No, so uh, yeah, we said that suppose there is only one particle, the steady state is the particle can be equally likely anywhere. Okay. What is the mean activity? Mean activity is 1 per particle, 1 total, 1 per particle, because it can jump. Okay. Uh, most of the time it is not jumping, that is because gamma 1 is close to 0. So, mean activity is proportional to gamma 1. Okay. All right. Um, yeah, so, let us um, write that down. <coughs> But before I write that down, let me make a further analogy. So, there is a older problem, well studied problem, which is called the resistor network problem. So, this 
So, you take a square lattice and there are two resistances R 1 and R 2, which occur with probability p and 1 minus p. Okay? And each bond is independently occupied with probability p by resistance R 1 with probability 1 minus p with resistance R 2. Then I look at the big block of size L by L and I look at the bulk conductance of this stuff and I ask how does this bulk conductance sigma vary with my parameter p. Okay? And let us take R 2 is less than R 1. Um, yeah, it is correct, but maybe I should work with conductances instead of resistances. So, this conductance is sigma 1 and this conductance is sigma 2 and sigma 2 is less than sigma 2 is greater than sigma 1. So, what so p is the probability there? The of sigma 1. Then, okay, if not sigma 1, what is this other? Sigma 2. Oh. Only two possible value of resistances. Okay. So, this can be both can be the horizontal. Yeah, no, all bonds are equally, there is no anisotropy in the direction here. Okay, this is a static problem, there is no time. Okay. So, what happens is that when I increase p, I increase the concentration of sigma 2 which is higher conductivity. So, average conductivity will rise. I suppose at p equal to 0, the conductance will be sigma 1, every bond is equal and at p equal to 1, it will be sigma 2. And we wanted to determine what is this function in between. Okay. This problem is kind of difficult, it has not been solved so far. So, let us uh, not aim for too much, but let me note that if sigma 1 is much much less than sigma 2, then let me just say sigma 1 is 0. So, that is a simple case where either the bonds are present or absent. Right? and all present bonds have the same conductance. Then I know the answer looks like this. Initially, there is no conduction and afterwards the conductance rises and this is sort of, this is the standard percolation problem. This is a sort of generalized percolation problem, but there is the dual of this problem, which is I can put sigma 2 equal to infinite. Some bonds are with finite conductance, other bonds are superconducting. In which case, this is p 1 uh, sigma 1 equal to 0 and this one is sigma 2 equal to infinite and then what happens is that after the percolation threshold p c, the conductance of the full sample will be infinite. Okay. So, in this case, I can define some exponent here, you know how does this conductance rise. And in this case, I can define some exponent here, how does this conductance become infinite and uh, maybe there is some connection between these different exponents. This is classical percolation um, theory kind of problem. I will let you figure out the answer. It is also available in all books, so it is not a major problem. I will not discuss it right now here. Okay. It turns out that the rate at which this thing rises can be related to the rate at which this thing diverges. Let us just stop there. But it is very interesting to you know not read up some book and work out on your own or think at least for a day, see if you can figure out the answer without consulting a book. because the um, um, some thinking is required, but the knowledge base required is the same as what BSc students already have, Ohm's law, nothing more is required. Okay. Uh, very good. So, so uh, what is the connection with my problem here? Suppose I work in the absorbing phase, then I will put gamma 4 equal to infinite 
and gamma 1 equal to finite. Okay. So, what happens is that particles jump with a small rate, but once they reach a place where there is a site with height 4, it topples immediately and the next site if it there is a 4, it will also topple immediately. So, the all the topplings occur immediately in no time and then the system just goes from one stable configuration to another stable configuration to another stable configuration and then I can ask what is the average amount of activity per unit time. Right, and that will diverge like this if I am increasing um, increasing the density. Okay. And I can do the opposite, I can go to the high density limit, high density case and imagine that gamma 1 is small. So, the particles single particles can hop but they hop at a very slow rate and if they do not hop the system just keeps on toppling and toppling and toppling, but then once in a while the single particles also hop and does it make a difference to the active state maybe not maybe yes, but anyway I can study the two problems and so this is actually a sand pile problem. The BTW model has been augmented in some way I have added um, new driving mechanism, I have added density as a parameter, but if I can understand this problem then I could perhaps understand the previous problem as well. So, that is the bottom line that is the connection between the sand pile problem and the active absorbing state problem. The difficulty in implementing this kind of procedure is that actually you know what you have to do is you have to look at the time series sizes of avalanches then you have to deduce from them the critical exponent in the active phase and a critical exponent in the absorbing phase. This involves looking at big avalanches because you know you have to take log log plots. So, if you look at big avalanches the data becomes sparse there are few events and then you have to go close to the critical threshold, you have to look at big avalanches, you are working with small statistics, then the interpretation and calculation of the exponents is not so easy and there is a little bit of quibble and somebody will say if you analyze the data differently you will get a different answer which is quite reasonable. There are also these questions like ok you said that yeah I can take gamma 4 equal to infinity, gamma 1 equal to 0 plus or 1, right now it does not matter then it is just ok it needs 1. So, the steady state now is it in any way related to the steady state of the BTW model even at the critical point need not be ok. But many of these questions cannot be answered exactly, so you can do some simulations, but as I said near critical point the relaxation times become long and all kinds of trouble in interpreting exponents and so the issue has not been fully sorted out in all cases. So, what we would like or actually in any case, so what we would like to do is we like to study some simple model where you can address these issues explicitly by a simple exact calculation, then in models where you cannot do these exact calculations one can still hope that the same general scenario will work or whatever lessons we have learnt from the exactly soluble case can be used in the not so solved cases. Okay. So, that is what I want to do in the rest of the lecture or in the rest of the lect um, tomorrow lecture as well is to actually study some model for which you can get the solution exactly and then calculate some of these questions and then see how far we can go in this general understanding of is there a connection or you know if there is a big controversy what is the controversy about and what is the resolution of the controversy.
Okay. So, what we will do now is to a simple soluble sand pile model. So, this model is called uh, wooden blocks on a staircase. And so, you imagine, let us see, my drawings are not great, but we can. So, there is a staircase, um, Okay, and uh, there is a child which is sitting at the top of the staircase and playing with wooden blocks. So, he throws the wooden block on the stairs and they come and sit there and for my purpose the block is kind of like that. So, there is some block here and there is another block here and so on. Okay. So, the rule is that if it so happens that two blocks come and sit on top of each other, then they become unstable and they topple and they go down. One goes to the left and one goes to the right. That, that may not sound immediately very reasonable, but that is the simplest model one can think of. Okay. Now, it was actually inspired by the original sand pile problem because in the sand pile problem it is well appreciated that most of the activity occurs on the surface and the grains which are deeply buried inside the pile do not move much or let us say they do not move at all. So, the grains which do not move at all are replaced by a staircase and the only is on the surface there are some grains which are moving whose dynamics we are discussing. So, they can either sit there and if there are too many of them at some place then they topple and they go down. And so, the child keeps on throwing particles and the mother has to keep on collecting them from the floor below that is the model. Okay. So, if I want to write a more easy to draw representation of this we will use our old picture or square let is tilted and so there is a variable n x t which is the number of grains at x t, x t is the label x is this way, t is this way. Okay. And uh, it is convenient to write the case that x plus t is always even. Okay. So, this side has coordinate 0 0, this side has coordinate minus 1 1, this side has coordinate plus 1 plus 1, because this time is 1 2 3, this is to the left it is minus 1, this to the right it is plus 1, but in between here there is nothing. So, there is nothing called plus 1 sorry 0 plus 1 there is no such code in sight. x plus t always has to be even or you can say start with a square lattice and get rid of half the sides and then look at the rest. Okay. So, the stable values of n are 0 or 1 if n is greater than equal to greater than 1, then n go n x t goes to n x t minus 2 and n x plus minus 1 t plus 1 
each of the two lower sides gets one grain each. It's as simple as that. Okay. If the particle reaches the lowest rung, then the grains are lost. And you know the mother collects them, gives them to the baby in the basket and he keeps on them throwing them again if necessary. Okay. So, as we agreed, this system will have a steady state, then it will be some configuration, stable configuration, then the child will throw one block, it will cause an avalanche and I will like to understand the statistics of these avalanches. What is the probability that it will have three toplings, what is the probability that it will have five toplings and so on. Can we understand that? Is the definition of the model clear? There are no questions. Okay. So, yes. Yes. Yes, sorry, yeah, if n x t. Yes. Yeah, it decreases by 2. Two particles are lost. So, if there were 3 in the beginning, 1 will be left and 2 will go down. In this, in this, um, oh, side by side here is I will interpret them, these are side by side on this layer, on this rung of the staircase. This is one side, this is the next side, this is the next side, that is the next side. Then the next side, so if you have two adjacent ones here, the two adjacent ones below are shifted by half. So, when things topple from here, they topple on two adjacent particles. Yes, this, the downward is time and the x is transverse. Are being randomly yeah, the particles are added randomly, you can assume they are added only on the top layer, but they can also be added anywhere. We will see that it actually does not make any difference and you get the same steady state. Okay. the two downward neighbors each gets one grain each. They are not randomly distributed, one goes to the left, one goes to the right. Okay. Very good. So, now, I would like to determine the steady state of this system. So, what uh, you know I imagine that there is a steady state after all something or the other, then I will add one particle and then I see what happens. That depends on what was there in the beginning. So, I need to determine the probabilities of different configurations in the steady state, different stable configurations in the steady state. Yes. So, I want to determine probability of C, uh, where C is a stable configuration. For all C, that is the determination of the steady state. So, how do I determine this? Well, this is some in the end this is a Markov process. I start with some configuration, I add a particle at random, I do not know where I am adding. Depending on where I add, the system makes a transition to a different state. So, at any given time it is in one configuration, it has some probability to go to a different configuration. 
okay. and so it is a Markov process and for this Markov process there is a steady state and we want to determine what is the steady state. So, I need to determine this uh, transition matrix. So, I will write P of P plus 1 C is equal to W C prime So, this is the probability that you were in configuration C at time t, the, uh, okay, this is a t is below and this is the probability that you are in configuration C at time t prime, C prime and C goes to C prime with rate w and you multiply that sum over C, you give, get the probability of being in state C prime at time t plus 1, is that clear? So, think of this as a big vector, this is a big matrix, this is a big vector and you want to find the Eigen vector of this matrix with Eigen value 1, that determines the steady state. And we said that there will be one Eigen vector with Eigen value 1 uh, and uh, that was Peron Frobenius theorem. Okay. All right. So, what are the, what is this matrix? First question is what is the size of this matrix? So, what are the stable configurations? So, let us consider a finite lattice which is size L in this direction and size M in this, um, no, M in this direction and L in this direction, total number of sites is L times M okay. and so what are the total number of stable configurations? Yes sir, yes. So, the number of stable configurations is 2 to the power L M. 2 to the power number of sites, because every site can be either 0 or 1, 2 is unstable, 2 is not allowed. Okay. So, in this matrix is 2 to the power um, number of sites times 2 to the power number of sites is a very big matrix. So, it is hard for me to write down the 16 by 16 matrix or 256 by 256 matrix. So, can we still tell what are its eigenvalues and eigenvectors. You got to make a good representation of the matrix in order to determine its eigenvectors. Okay. Um, so, what can I say about this? Well, one question which is very important in all these general Markov processes is can you go from any configuration to any configuration? or is the state space broken up into two disjoint or two or more disjoint regions. You know these are some states, when I jump from here I can go here or here, and from here I can go there, there, but I cannot jump from here to here. So, the steady state breaks up into lots of disjoint classes of configuration, this is one class, this is another, this is another, right. So, is it like this or is, you know, how many disjoint sets are there? So, this is very nice, there is a proof, very simple one, we say any state you can go to any other state. Okay. These proofs are sort of, you know, there are so many states, how do I construct a proof like this? Well, if you start with an all empty state, then you can certainly go to any state from that all empty state just by adding particles at the desired places. Right. So, now next question, if you give me a configuration with some configurations of 1s and zeros, can I go from there to the all empty state? Yes. 
you seem to be very, uh, you seem to be say, saying that it cannot happen. Hmm? No. Yes. Can how? Okay, uh, he says it can be done. Anybody else? So actually, that proof works. So what you do? You give me the configuration. So let us say there is a one here, there is a one here, there is a one here. And I want to convert these ones to zeros. So I realize that let us take this, take care of this one, convert it into a zero. How can I do that? Add a particle there, that is all I am allowed to do. I am only allowed to add particles and let them topple. So if you add a particle there, this will become zero and these two will become one. So on the top layer, I can make the full layer 0 because they only topple particles send them down. Afterwards, I do not touch the top layer, I only add particles to the second layer and then I can make them 0, right. So, from any state I can go to a state in which every you know keep on pushing um, particles down and eventually everything will be empty. So, from any configuration I can go to any configuration. So, there must be a single unique steady state vector. Yes, we are working yeah this model as I um, should have perhaps uh, in, um, emphasized we are working in the config um, framework where particles are added from outside and they are removed. Okay. Okay. So it says that uh, there is a unique steady state. That was because from any place you can go to any place. Okay. But that does not determine the probabilities of configurations in the steady state. For this one needs actually some second result which is uh, interesting and uh, well to find it first time is non trivial, but when it is explained it is fairly obvious. So, it is the following. So, the dynamics of this uh, toppling rules are such that if you give me a configuration C, some stable configuration with zeros and ones, you know one particle here, one particle there, one particle there, one particle there and you tell that you added here, okay. then the rules tell you what is the final configuration C prime, where are the ones, where are the zeros in the final configuration. Right. Now, let me ask a different question. Suppose I give you C prime and I tell you that yes, I added the particle here, but I do not know this configuration. Can I determine what was the starting configuration such that when I added a particle I got to C prime? Yes. Mm, okay, let us try somebody else if he, they can answer. Yeah, it is possible. So yeah, you, so you will have to answer what are the possible starting configurations from which I could have got to C prime. Sorry? If you go from any state to any other state, there should be No, 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 sorry. Any state to any other state, 
by adding particles with chosen places, but now I am not allowed to add any particles. I am adding particle right here, I have reached here, I in between I do not add any particles, I am asking what could have been the starting configuration such that adding a single particle at a specified site I reach C prime. Yes, louder. Huh? Yeah, can we backtrack? Yeah, can we backtrack? Yeah. So, can be done, cannot be done? Can be done. Okay. So, actually, let me not add at the top, let me add here. So, let us actually state it in this way which is what our so i don't know what is the configuration here there is some configuration okay but i have got to this final configuration where there is one 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 here and i know that i added here okay and I want to know what is the starting configuration, what is the position of ones in the initial con configuration. So, I say that well you know I am added here anything I do will topple things below, right. So, all the stuff above must be unchanged. So, at least I have determined all the configurations of all these uh, I can determine uniquely, right. Now, comes to this point. I added a particle and it has become a 1. So, what should have been there before? 0, zero. that is the only choice, there is nothing else I can do. So, once I, so I must have been a 0, I became a 1, then no toppling could have occurred. So, everything else must also be the same, right. So, I determine the initial configuration it is unique in this special case. Suppose it was in not 1, it was a 0 here and I knew I added a particle here. Then it must have been a 1 to begin with because it became a 0 now. So, I know what it is here, this is a 1, but then going from 1 to 0 I must have toppled. So, here there must have been two particles which came in here, one here and one there. Then I look at these ones and see is it 1 now then it must have been 0 before and vice versa and then you can go down in this way and there is a unique C for any given C prime. Okay. This is not necessary for all possible toppling rules, you know you can make other sand pile models with different toppling rules and this will not be true always. So, this is a special simplifying feature of this particular model is that of course, the toppling rules are deterministic, but they are also reversible. You can go from C to C prime, but given C prime you can uniquely determine C. Okay. So, now using this much information can I determine the steady state of the system and the answer is that this is enough to determine uniquely what is the steady state of this system. Okay, let me just uh, get through that part of the argument. So, now um, this is some other, this is the phase space. This is one configuration, this is a different configuration. There are 2 to the power n uh, different configurations in this. And when I start and let me fix that I add at site 37 whatever some particular site. Then if I am in this state, I will go to that state. If I am in this state, I will go to that state. If I am in this state, I go to that state and like that. I just start with some given state and I say where does it go and then again where does it go, where does it go. I keep on doing this. So, what will happen eventually? This is a finite dimensional set, so eventually it must come back, nothing else it can do. 
So, what can it do? It can come back like this, right. So, then what will happen is that there will be two different initial conditions which go to the same end point, but we said that is impossible. So, that does not happen. So, the state must look like this, this goes to this, this goes to this and this comes back. Okay. Maybe all the configurations are not exhausted by this process. So, I can start with a different configuration here that will go to that one, 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 that will go to that one and all will come back. Okay. And there may be another loop like that and another loop or some such thing. Okay. But they are all made up of cycles. You cannot have anything other than a cycle. In a general Markov chain, you can have configurations where more than one thing come in and one goes out, okay. or you can have some stuff where nothing comes in, but something goes out. All those configurations are not possible here, no absorbing states are possible here. Okay. So, if you have a system which goes like this, one possible steady state is where every configuration has equal probability. After all, on a ring of configurations like this, clearly every configuration should have equal probability. Okay. But the probabilities may be different on different rings. Ha. So, what happens is that under operator is adding at one particular site, the system breaks up into some rings like this. However, you can also add at a different point. If you add at a different point, this point will go there. You know this is configuration C, C goes to C prime if you add at one point and it goes to C double prime if you add at a different point. Okay. So, if I only look at C going to C double prime and keep on adding at that point, I will again get cycles like this, that was the argument. And that says that all these different cycles should also have the same value of p. So, in the end all the 2 to the power n different states will be equally likely in the steady state. Okay. So, let us write that down. different stable configurations are equally likely. In the steady state, okay. So, once we got this far, then the rest is very easy. So, we know the steady state, there are 2 to the power n different configurations of zeros and 1s and they are all equally likely. So, if you look at any particular site that has equal chance to be either 0 or 1 in the steady state. So, now I ask the question that I pick a point at random and I throw a particle there, sorry pick a site at random and throw a particle there, what will happen? Well, with probability half originally there will be nothing there and it will not nothing will happen. So, probability that number of toplings equal to 0 on a randomly chosen particle you add there will be half. Okay. What is the probability that you add a particle and exactly one toppling occurs and nothing more? Okay. Well, this is my lattice, I add here, there is one toppling, so it should have been a 1 to begin with, but then that will throw a particle here and a throw particle here, but these should not topple, so they must be 0 here right in the beginning. 
So, so long as that happens, I do not care what happens in the rest of the lattice, there will be only one toppling. So, what is the probability that I will get a 1 and 0 and a 0? 1 by 8. Okay. What is the probability that you will have exactly two topplings when you add a particle at the origin, some site? Okay, well, two topplings can occur in different ways. You know, you can start here and the, maybe this will also topple, or you start here and this will topple and this does not topple. Right? So, you can check that this must have been 1 to begin with, then it comes here, this should topple, so this should be a 1, this should not topple, that should be a 0, this should not topple, this should be a 0, this should be a 0. So, this should be 1, this should be 1, 0, 0, 0, 1 upon 2 to the power 5. And same thing here. So, the answer here is 1 upon 2 to the power 5 times 2 is 1 by 16. Okay. And um, depending on the time available, I should work out explicitly what is the probability of exactly 3 topplings. Okay. I will not work out in full detail, but let us see. 3 topplings can occur like this, this comes here and this comes here and this comes here or this topples and then this topples and this topples and this does not topple and this does not topple and this does not topple like that or it could be this one something like this or it could be something like this right or maybe could be like this, this topples, this topples, this topples and then that is 3 topplings. This one is not possible, because if this topples and this topples, this will send one particle down, this will send one particle down, even if originally they were 0, it will be 2 and it will topple. So, this is forbidden, erase and calculate the probability of each of these, add them up that gives you the probability of s equal to 3. And the same exercise can be done for s equal to 4, 5, 6, 7, it is a little bit of work, but it is a finite calculation. Okay. For an infinite lattice, I can get the answer with a finite calculation for any finite s. Okay. So, I can determine the statistics of these avalanches and um, that is some sort of uh, con you know comforting thought okay but what i would like to do is to determine the behavior of this system for large s large number of large avalanches then of course this brute force counting becomes a little bit tedious and it is difficult and you would like to be able to see if that can also be obtained by some simpler argument than brute force counting. Okay. I will write. Yes. Yes. No, no, no. So, the argument is that uh, infinite is just very large, but finite. Okay. It does not depend on the size of the lattice, the rest of the argument, it, the argument about cycles depends only on the finiteness of the system. Yeah, so, if you have an infinite system, you cannot give that argument. So, I do not take the system to infinite in the beginning, first I derive the fact that the result is a product measure, then I say okay, now you can let the system be infinity, I do not care. Okay. Okay. So, can we determine the behavior for large s by a simpler argument and uh, that can be done and that is like the following. Let us consider a biggish avalanche, this site it comes here, it topples this one, which topples this one, but that one comes here 
and this site as we argued must topple and maybe maybe this set of sites topples and the other sets other sites do not topple. So, I want to determine the probability of such thing. So, the first comment is that in this avalanche cluster, cluster of sites where some topplings have occurred, there are no holes. There are no holes because if there is a site here, it which has two upward neighbors which have toppled, then it must topple. So, it is not a hole. Is the argument clear? This is fairly automatic. Okay. So then, then the avalanche cluster can be specified by its two left and right boundaries. Okay. So here I come from this side, I draw the left boundary, it goes like this. Now I come here. At this side, there is a toppling. So it throws a particle here. If the this side topples, I add this to the boundary. If it does not topple, then I push the boundary to the right, like what we did in the previous argument. The probability that I will go left is half, probability I will go right is half. Okay. So, um, so each avalanche cluster has no hole uh, is hole less um, well <laughs> okay uh, it has no holes it has two boundaries left boundary and right boundary and each boundary is a random walk Okay. So, there is a left random work and there is a right random work. When they meet, the avalanche stops. So, then you just have to calculate what the, you know, suppose you start two walkers at two ends, so they would do random work, when will they meet? That is an answer which has been worked out in various books. I would have done it, but you know, my time is running out. So, probability that duration of avalanche. equal to t is equal to probability that two random workers starting at origin meet for the first time, meet again for the first time. after t steps. So, that is a random work problem, it has been studied a lot already. Mm, so, one looks up Feller's book, which is a well known textbook and the answer is worked out there. Okay. And it is known that this probability grows or varies s t to the power minus 3 by 2 for large t minus. Okay, so, I can deduce the distribution of avalanche sizes exactly durations and uh, it has a power law dependence which is t to the power minus 3 by 2 which can also be determined exactly. What about the size? Well, if the duration of the avalanche is t, these are random works. So, the transfer size is t to the power half, typical transfer size is t to the power half or the moments of the size will vary as t to the power half. Okay. Is this point clear? These are conditional expectation values for two random workers which are known to have met at finally time t for the first time. 
So, you start two random walkers, you know that they meet at time t. So, their separation, which is also a random walk, comes back to the origin at time t. Then you say, what is the typical size excursion of this random walk? And that will vary as t to the power half. Okay. So, then, so uh, probability that uh, Okay, so this let us just do, and that is the end of this. Probability that duration is greater than t goes as t to the power minus half. So, probability that transfer size transverse size is greater than t to the power half goes as t to the power minus half. So, I do not like to write t, I should write c goes as c to the power minus 1, just trade variables. Okay? I did not write that, is it okay if I leave it like this or I should write the next line? probability that transverse size greater than c varies as 1 by c. Okay. Uh, what about the total number of toplings? Well, every side topples once inside this cluster. The area of the cluster varies as t to the power 3 by 2. Okay. So, the probability that number of toplings is of the order of greater than t to the power 3 by 2 goes as t to the power minus half. Okay. So, that says that is greater than s goes as s to the power minus one third. Okay. So, I can determine these and if you wanted something else to determine, I could do that also in a similar way. This requires a little bit of work and the properties are reducible to properties of the boundaries which move like random walks. So, the problem is easy to do. Okay. Um, so, in the seven minutes available, uh, what should I do? Um, I should do. Hmm. So, in my notes, he says I should discuss river networks. Since people find that very funny, I guess it is not possible to do that in that kind of it is possible to do actually. Let me try. Okay. So, let us discuss a simple model of river networks. The model is defined as follows you have a nearly flat landscape in which there is some overall slope which is going south for us. Okay. Uh, so, nearly flat landscape and we imagine there is a uniform rain, rainfall. Ah, sorry, before this, so we discuss whether if you add particles everywhere or you add particles only at the top, will the answer change? Okay. So, it is easy to check that this steady state we determine. If you add a particle afterwards, uh, you know all configurations are still equally likely. So, certainly it is a steady state. Is it the only possible steady state? Hmm. 
the answer turns out to be no. And uh, that is easy to explain and let me do that instead of this other problem. So, it goes like this. Suppose you have this stuff and there are some ones inside and so on. Now, if I add particles at the top, then sometimes the particles um, stay there, sometimes they topple. But when they topple, only even number of particles go down. Okay? And when in the next layer some toppling occurs, only even number of particles go down. So, the parity of the number of particles in each layer must be conserved in time. So, all the 2 to the power L m states cannot be accessed from each other if you only add particles at top. They break up into 2 to the power L minus 1 disjoint classes. Okay. But within each disjoint class, all configurations are equally likely. Okay. But then it turns out that if you look for these marginal probabilities, like what is the probability that a single site will be 0 or 1, in the limit of large width, those answers become do not depend on this. You know, so I have m sites here and uh, I know that the total number of particles is odd, but I do not know anything more and all those configurations are equally likely. right? Then if I look at a particular site, it is almost equally likely to be odd or even, whether the total number is odd or even. Okay? So, the corrections to the um, answer which was worked out here vanish in the limit of large system sizes. So, I do not need to worry about this detail, though technically it is true that if you add only particles at top, then you do not, you cannot access all possible states starting from a given one. Okay. Okay. So, only in the 2 minutes remaining, the only thing I can say is that you can take this model, but you know it is work in a 2 plus 1 dimensional system. So, you have particles here which throw things down to the next layer below like that directed model. Uh, I guess every particle I can think of an um, orange piling. So, every particle has 3 downward neighbors and it throws three, you know if there is a doubling it goes to three downward neighbors and so on and then you discuss all these problems and the treatment will go through in total uh, except i guess this random work argument because in higher dimensions the surface of the cluster is not a line it is a more complicated shape okay but at least some things like this probability that s equal to 1 to 3 you can work out explicitly and then you can see if you can try to do this in 5 dimensions no? 4 plus 1. Okay. And so, let me stop there. In fact, let me say that there is nothing to do with the argument just goes through in total. They, it does not care about the dimension of the lattice, you just verify that everything just goes through without any special um, treatment. Okay. Okay, so, I stop here.